it has been far beyond uh, medicine. So, can I have the next slide? So, I suppose of you spoke, and those of you did not speak, I'm sure you knew this, but you were the first time to speak. Ethics is a discipline that's concerned with what is morally good or bad or wrong. So, it's a set of moral values that an individual establishes for oneself. That also includes your religion. I don't know. Uh, so this word comes from a Greek word called ethos, which is similar to the word that we have character. Not the character we have similar to the Greek word, but the individual's character. And you see some of the word here. But what we are talking about today is adding the relation to Rika. So Rika ethics relates to what issues that arise during or as a result of research activities, and also the conduct of each individual, now a doctor, as a researcher, and the implications that these issues have in relation to our research community as a whole. Okay, thank you. So Somebody said, oh, so there is a bit of a difference between rules and the rules and the difference between law and the rules. So, a law is a systematic set of rules that govern the whole society and actions of its political lives. I'm not going to be very funny. If I do, there is in the code that says that you have to be There is some other act which says that you have to money for somebody, and then you have to go back to the father. So those are laws. So those are set of rules and And because they are fixed, they are society wide, they are generally laid down by to be central government, it could be state government. Sometimes there is also a municipal because we have only here. Uh, governments. Once the rule the law is made, it is set in writing, and then you are not supposed to violate this. And if you violate, the law also lays down what the punishment is for violation, which could be in the form of imprisonment, it should be in the form of money. Sometimes court also finds some other way of asking you to do something else. Uh, you know, do something for that. Way. And the purpose of a law is to maintain social order and peace in the society and to protect one each. Ethics, on the other hand, are much more philosophical. They are much more of an idea. They can vary from person to person. And these are things that all of us think and talk. And possibly for many situations, all of us will agree what is ethical, but the conversation that we have. And this is what guides one's behavior of all the human beings. And these are violent. Everybody may not follow them exactly with the same. People may follow them to different degrees. Sometimes a group of people lays down a certain behavior, and we say this is acceptable. And it could also, could also sometimes change from time to time. But generally, no. They are at much more abstract and there is no punch. And they don't have a binding. All of us think that we should not speak the truth. So that's not a truth. It's a ethical behavior. It is time it's not us that we speak the truth. Different people follow it to a different degree, as all of us know. What is absolute truth also we sometimes don't know what is absolute truth. As physicians, we very often have our patients in life. We tell them, no, no, don't worry, you'll get better. We know it, that it's a lie. But there is something else, some other concern that overtakes this ethical principle of trying to tell the truth. And therefore, it becomes acceptable for us to tell something a lie. And say that you will get better probably. Right? But there are situations we are telling a line in London. Like this. So, even though this session is supposed to be on ethics related to research, I'm going to talk about general for doctors. Doctors have always had 
importance of ethics. So you can see the code which came about 2500 years ago. That is lays down a set of ethics for us. If you go to other cultures, so in the Arab culture, there is this book written by Al Mahdi, the 19th century tradition, we have on this middle. And you know, even in the Indian system of medicine, there are ethical principles, we don't have the ethics so much, but they have been there all the time. Next thing. So, biomedical research has been very good research, but we also know that we can take the last century. It is written for several centuries, but before our modern medicine will get it. But initially, it was mostly of the And over time, we have gone through interventional research. And in interventional research, ethical research is much more important than the original research. This is usually the topic I will introduce. So, the first of the interventional study, the clinical trial, was done by James Lind, who lived in the 18th century. And this is the trial of the study. So, in 1747, this is what he writes in his book. On the 20th of May, 1747, I took 12 patients, they were all sailors, in the study on board the territory that the naval ship had seen. Their cases were as similar as I could find them. They all in general excluded doubts, the spot, fatigue, lassitude, and weakness of their knees. They lay together in one place, being a proper apartment of the ship in the forehold, the front part of the ship. At one time in common, there is water growing, sweetened with sugar in the morning. Fresh mutton broth often times for dinner, and other times puddings, white biscuit, and with sugar, and for supper, garlic, and raisins, and whatever. That too. In addition, they received one of the six things cider, sulfuric acid, vinegar, sea water, oranges, and melon, or a slightly taste made from barley water. So, obviously, there were 12 of them who received each of these treatments. Treatment of fruit spikes from the same sales because they never took food. One of the sailors was fit for duty and another had almost done. Apart from that, to leave you one shows some effect of food. So that's the first render for I think the reverse style. It was the first clinical trial. Right? Did you find any problem in this trial? Anyone? Yes? Who said yes? You said so. Tell me. How did he decide? So he should have decided at training. Okay. Anybody else? As was the moment of decide also? Please participate. Nothing will go wrong. Nothing will happen to you guys. Anybody? Yes, sir. Consent. No consent. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. No randomization, that's what he also said. How did he choose the right one treatment? No proof of it. Justification. Okay, fine. So, by that time, people had some idea that he take to some things. May I go back? Can we go back to your previous slide? So, if you see all of these are so much star. Okay. okay. Anybody else? Okay, let's go to the next thing. Uh, so, this is past mustard today. To me, no. Next thing. There was a very small sample size in each group, group of two. There were too many treatments. If you don't think we have six treatments in a trial, we could have one or two or three. There was no random allocation. He didn't take epistemic clearance. Would I want to do this? He didn't take consent. That's what the lady there said. The subjects were his subordinate. Poor fellows had to do what he wanted them to do. They were unwell. They couldn't leave the ship and go anywhere else. Okay. And of course, today, in the 21st century, we would say no trial in this mission would run, but I am sure you'll hear about later. Next, please. <coughs> so, but then that was 18th century. Let's move forward. In late 18th century, we have moved on 50 years. There was this gentleman, gentleman by the name of Edward Jenner, by whose name is Sphere. So he took uh, a milkmaid by the name Sarah, who had Cowpox infection on her hands. She, you can see, was lesion on her arms. He took the pus from those, inoculated them on a child by the name James Phipps. 
he had a mild illness in Hong A few days later, he had a patient who had small pox with the scans and inoculated the boy whom he had given pox with small pox and he was unaffected and he showed the result of the And this was eight year old son of his father, not his own son. And he did for 23 other people, and he's including much later to his own 11 months old. Right? And we would think it was a little. Nobody raised questions. We all think generated something good. None of us questioned that, at least. So, one thing that we learned from this, at least, change with time. At that time, it was considered acceptable to do all this, but no longer. That is because beliefs and values of people have changed. Relationships have changed and behavior has changed, and therefore, the ethics we said is a lot to do with behavior, a lot to do with beliefs, a lot to do with how people interact with each other, and that's why ethics of research have changed. Right? Let's move further forward from 1796 we come to 1816. This is Alexander Hamilton, a naval surgeon in UK. At that time, blood treating was a common treatment. If you were sick, they would give you a wound, blood will go out. They would thought that bad blood will go out and you will become better. And he decided to do a trial. He thought this was not something that didn't work. It had been so arranged that this number was admitted, so this number of patients were admitted. Alternately, in such a manner that each of us had one third of the book. So he divided the patients one by one, first one who was there, second to second one, third to third one. The sick were indiscriminately the same and were attended as nearly as possible with the same care and accommodated with the same comforts. One part of former soldiers of the 61st Regiment, remainder of my own, neither Mr. Anderson nor I ever employed the death set. That's it to remove blood. He lost two patients, I lost four, whereas the third treated with blood treating by the third surgeon. This was medical research in the early 19th century. Next. So this is in patients with scarlet fever. They were one to three boys for whom I had perfectly satisfactory evidence. They had not had, they had not previously had scarlet fever. I divided them into sections, taking them alternately from the list to prevent implication of the so This is how ideas of randomization, having a control group came in. So the first section I gave Banatunar. If you still that if you give them Banatunar, they would have less in here, less, they would have less amount of pain. And to the second I gave none, the result was in each section were attacked by the disease. The number were too small to justify reductions as so you know, don't be then one out of 75 who had less than one out of 76 who had whether they have banana or not. That is not saying that the two people having there, I cannot make a conclusion. What we do then do at you know, p value but statistical test to know. But the observation is good because in that time people were giving melanoma and trying to say look at it should have the uh, very uh, sorry that many people will get in less, but because we are giving melanoma, so they don't get it. So this was a trial of removing the treatment and get it. Next please. <laughs> Similarly, there were trials on uh, and get serum. Next, please. I think I'll skip this. Next, please. And then he said some people were given anti dipteric or serum, others were not given. And he raises the issue. To make the trial as objective as possible, I have not relied on my own children, but have sought the views of assistant physician without telling them that. So that's the concept of blinding coming in and he's bringing that in. Next, please. Now, let's look at some other studies. So, uh, Senerelli was an Italian bacteriologist who identified the bacteria, which he thought caused yellow fever. Today, we know it's wrong. It's not a bacteria. It's a virus that causes yellow fever. He injected what he thought was the yellow fever isolate into five persons without getting any consent, three of whom died. And this is what triggered the first major debate about inoculating people with a pathogen. And he was extensively criticized, and the world started changing. And this is in 1897, about the day 28. Next, please. 
Then we come to the Walter Reed. You, some of you might have heard of Walter Reed Institute. It's a famous institution that has a lot of pathology. I'm sure Vinita uh, knows it because a lot of pathology research in the world. He was a physician in the US Army. In 1901, he led a team which confirmed the theory that yellow fever is transmitted not from person to person, but by two organisms. So he introduced for the first time a concept of better bond transmission of this infection. And this is what actually led to removal or eradication of yellow fever by oxycopal zone in many parts of the world. So it is really respected. Next, please. So what he did was he needed people to be bitten by mosquitoes that had bitten somebody who had had yellow fever to prove this, right? And yellow fever at that time was going to be a disease with about 20 and 30 percent of time. And he now introduced the concept of modern disease. So he wanted, he told people that you could and go to the And you can see this scan paper. I've seen Mark those two boxes. He's talking about hundred dollars in the disease. He said, if you agree to be bitten, participate in this study and be bitten by mosquitoes that have already. Uh, had a wife or a person who has yellow fever, we will give you 100 dollars. Remember, this is 1901, right? 100 dollars is And if you get sick, then you will get another 100 dollars. So that's one further step in experimentation of the yellow There are problems we have even learned during the whole course, but that is how science has progressed. And actually, it depends. There were other people who thought actually they were terrible. Because these were mostly US soldiers who were coming to that place. You can get yellow fever only once. You moved into Panama or some area where there is so much of yellow fever that very likely you will get it anyway. So if you agree to participate in the study, you will get that once like this. So whether this is an unusual inducement that you will talk about in the next four or five days, you can discuss it that time. Next, please. This is another 50 years down the line, 1950s, after the Second World War, about which I talked in the next few slides. We are all aware of polio vaccines. So there was this vaccine. They said volunteers from the foundation would work to state and local health departments and schools to get parental consent and deliver the child for the They went to schools, they tried to convince parents. The alternative was the use of a placebo control group seemed to be too much of a calculated risk. Then if you tell the people that we will random to one group or the other, so they would go to those schools to the field. And compared to other schools where this was not done, they found that if you were trying to tell people that they have option or that they would be randomized, and they said. The use of a placebo and produce, we are talking, start talking about randomization, seemed to be too much of a calculated risk. One that parents, teachers, and health officials would detect. In Sark's words, that would be a beautiful experiment over which an epidemiologist would be quite excessive, but which would make a humanitarian shudder. You could tell people that some of you will not get this vaccine and some will. It, so, you know, people started thinking that that was ethically wrong. However, what is going to the other side? 1939 to 1945 was the second world war. And Germany was ruled by Hitler, and the Nazis did a lot of things. Let's see what all they did. Their idea was actually to do something for the sake of war. How could they build the war? And what could they use and what were the effects of that? And what enemy they use and what were the effects of that? So they did experiments where they took Jews as prisoners and they took them to the low pressure tanks where oxygen pressure was low. To see them, how long they could survive, they would get oxygen. And those who did not die, then they put water into the tank until they died. Then they did autopsies to see what was the effect of low oxygen on their body organs. They did breathing experiments where they put them outdoors in winter, European winter, without any clothing, and or put them in a freezing water bath. And then they said they'll be warm. But when they were reborn, most of the time they were not successful. Next page. These are all supposedly scientific experiments. Many of them have been published in journals. 
They didn't believe in Spanish because they thought that their army had to go to Pigua, they had to go to areas where there is malaria, and they had some drugs that they thought would be used for malaria. Why did our people tested on prisoners of war, gave them malaria, and then gave them those drugs, and many of these drugs had adverse, serious adverse events in which people died. Similarly, experiments were done with mustard gas. There were experiments done on whether the coronavirus worked. They used wounds in prisoners and then gave them sulfonamide to see whether they would heal faster. Next day, they did experiments on typhus similar to malaria. They and sometimes <laughs> tried to see whether anti typhus was vaccine that they had made would work. Sometimes, because to do these experiments, they needed to have live typhus pathogen. So, just like we use, you know, culture of world so as to maintain world within the family, so that, you know, you have. They kept some people who they would do typhus, and before they would get better, they didn't try and inject into the next one and next one so that the, for experiments they could maintain the. Similarly, they would get experiments with poisons. Next thing, they did experiments with bombs. They did, they wanted to sterilize the Jews, and they first were doing surgery, and then they found surgery that too costly. Why not just expose them to radiation? And they did experiments of natrium, whether uh, radiation would uh, do uh, could lead into castration and this. And then it's an experiment with demand you think of. They thought that we need to have circles which are very well matched. So they took they had millions of Jews and they had several sets of identical patients. So they would do an experiment on one and use the other as a control. If the experiment is still doing right, the one who was not done will also still get an oxid so that they can compare their opus issues. They also try to do an experiment to create one joint pain by stitching together two things. Sometimes they will then leave and then think that we can't even imagine. Some of it would sound to you extremely cruel, but this was done by medical people, people who were like you and me. But it was done in the name of scientific research. So, when the Second World War ended and all this came to light, people were really upset. And people went and they set up something called as the Nuremberg Code. It's actually laid out by a group of theorists. And this is a set of ethical research principles for human experimentation. Now, it is actually the Westerners who brought in this thing. But if you look back, within Germany, there were a group of people who were opposed to what was happening during the Nazi atrocities. And actually, it is strongly believed that they were the ones who wrote these books, trying to influence Hitler that this is how experiments should be done. But it wasn't done. And one of those drafts was used by the US court. And on this uh, Nuremberg quote. He has the end of the book, next day. And these are there. I'm sure you'll be talking about it more. So, let's say for any kind of medical research, voluntary, you can find the patient that they're representing them. The voluntary consent of the subject is absolutely essential. The experiment should be such that it will lead to something that will be good for society. You can't do experiments that for the same experiment. And this information should not be available by any other means. The experiments should be so designed that the anticipated results, what benefit you will get, will justify the risk that you take the correct and will justify the experiment. No study should cause unnecessary physical or mental suffering or injury. If they already have believed that your study would lead to physical and your death, then you should not be doing that study. Degree of risk should never exceed the importance of problems to be solved. Problems to be solved. You must make adequate precautions, preparations, so that subjects can be protected against injury, disability, or death to the best of your uh, of possibility. Experiments should be done by people who are scientifically qualified and who are experts in the field. I cannot go and do experiments on surgical procedures that I am not uh, very well versed in. Subjects will be at different participation in the study at any time, and 
The research, and I would like to go to one of the last one. The researcher must be prepared to stop and study at any stage. Because when you start, you may not hear any kind of clarification. If you're building a development, you will come out and see what is happening. You can stop the research right now. Next thing. So, what I talked to you about nursing is not that. Only data history is written by people who are the police, the winner. Some similar things were also done in by the night process, like this. So I'm not going to that because there is similar to what was done by the success, but then that is not something that is very interesting. But yes, there is documentation that can happen on the other side. Can we get into some more regular research? Can we study this? This is and this is called the Tanji Syphilis study. It was started in 1933 by the US agency in a university at Hong Kong University, which is located in Alabama. They have 600 men, all different medical share problems. So it's a bit somebody white has a field and the black girl on the field, and they get a share of the job. 99 of them already had negative symptoms, and the other one is known as quote unquote symptoms. At that time, the drugs available for symptoms were pretty more. So they were drugs based on artery and new like that. And they wanted to see them if we don't clean them how they have. So I come up with the area and do it. They'll be observed. See what happens at that time, they will be treated with one of the available drugs. And the incentive was that if you participate in this, if you have any medical problem, we will provide you free medical care, which was not something that was done at that time, which was so fast. And I, the natural reason to study the white was available, but data and black was not available, so I have black data, and it will be more relevant to black, so they were white to grow new people. But they never informed that they had symptoms. They were just told that they had bad blood, which meant some infection. They were, at the time of 12 months observation, they were given treatments. But some people got arsenic, some people got some other treatments, and it was known that these treatments were not meant to be And they were kept from following, even though original plan was the same for In 1947, 15 years later, and this is the thing with them, and became a standard treatment for sickness. But these investigators never gave the They just continued to follow them on the international history, and this continued in 1972, for 40 years. Many of them died. During this period. Next week. And this is something that's considered as a major thing for which the US president after that was a colonial. And this is one thing. Why the rate of seeking healthcare among blacks in the US, even today in the home, because the real reason we go to the doctor, the doctor is not going to act in their best interest, they have their own interest and they are interested in research and that. We are a major problem of healthcare in the US today. Another field which is very close to my heart is the hepatitis. And these studies are going to talk about how this, you can get extreme views in the literature. Some of these people have been nominated to Nobel Prize, and they've got other prizes like the award, etc., which is considered as Nobel Prize Nobel. But there are others who think they were unethical. So this was a school. For mentally retarded children, most particularly for children with the Down syndrome. It's a bit like a residential school where if you have a child who has Downs, you go, you admit, and they look after. It was something very important because we are talking from 1950, 60s, 70s, the post World War II US, where it became important for both partners to work. If you wanted to have a good life, both men and women had to work. And if you had a child with a disability, there was a problem. And children, parents wanted their children with Down syndrome to be able. And this was whole crowded, it was full. And the children came there, the children cannot look after themselves, they are not toilet trained, they can even hear the children in the school, and the outbreak of pregnancy. It was once we thought that we could not have a school as a child, you don't have. Also, maybe some of them know when you are an Indian or depending on the gender you are, even hepatitis G is very common in children with Down syndrome. So, 
uh, they did some studies trying to look at the so SARS SAR movement in the well known uh, scientists in the field of biomedicine, so in the camera. They wanted there was some data to suggest that there are two types of hepatitis A, which was people or B, which is transmitted with blood. It was mainly known because during the Second World War, people who got yellow fever vaccine were from the most it was thought it was known that there was something called I think they wanted to do some studies on this. So these studies were very useful because they actually got documented proof that there was a common hepatitis. And then you can hepatitis A once, you cannot get it second time. If you can hepatitis B once, then you have to then you don't get it second time. And they also found that if you get some people in the problem, then you can prevent the scale of the problem. So they would take two from people who had you have a nice children, make a suspension and feed it to healthy new incoming children. Give them plasma from a person who previously been exposed to see whether the immune problems would affect and things like that. They investigate to justify this, but they're saying that anybody who enters any different communities, they're not being different. So you want we what we are doing is that in any level two months later, we are doing it today, but we are trying to get ways to protect these children. Can we protect such earlier this infection by using the uh, serum uh, the global resistance. And so that is how they justified. And they said that their parents had took their consent when they were admitted. Do you agree to your child being admitted? But people on the other side say parents have no other choice. They don't need the child to be And they would say in the male school, there is no space. It's not a similar to the PI or residential facility. Uh, but they also we still have space in our very little medical community, so you can anyone get it. These parents who wanted who had to feed other children, who had to look after other children and do other things, had no other choice but to say, fine, if you get everything, then go ahead and do it. But this came up, this came out later, and then this forced the discontinuation of the studies as they had right to study. Compare calls and immunologists and oncologists at Memorial Sloan Cafe, a famous oncology center in the US, who injected live cancer cells from patients with cancer into human subjects without telling even the human cancer. This point was that these cells they have different HNA molecules on their system. Body will recognize them as non cell and will take it, the immune system will take it. Whether that will happen or not, we don't know. So he used people in, from his side of some departments. He took people who were in jail on the right side, so this guy doesn't matter. He had to be but there were civilian people in the long term care who put the long term care on this. But then there were problems, and uh, there were a lot of going flat when he was going to work till he retired. Like this, like this. So, in 1964, also the questions are raised. This is New York Times, which is a, one of the famous newspapers in the US, but still, he continued to work in 71. Next is. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. He also tried something called as a Pestine virus. This is a virus that causes an infection. And the idea was to give people Pestine virus and they get infected. Their body will have such a strong immune response that it will take care of. Cancer cells. That immune response will have non specific immune response. Again, he is a highly reputed person, but his studies had problems like this. And this is actually what I was trying to say that a lot of these things were done even in the US during the Second World War. So if you want, you can go and look at this Wikipedia page like this. Something more interesting. So if you went to Sweden, they don't eat candies or sweets on all days of the day. They eat candies only on Saturdays. And Saturday is a big day. In all supermarkets, the candy shop will be open. Parents will take their children. They will buy lots of candies on that day. 
to be consumed on that day and then not on the other six days. And this comes from this way. So in 1940s, dental caries were common, and it was suspected that sugar is the one, eating sugar is what causes dental caries. So there was this white hole, which is again a facility for ventilated and active children. And in the time of was ready to whether eating sugar causes dental caries and not eating sugar would prevent dental caries. So in 1947, they took a group of a few hundred inmates and they started feeding large amounts of sweets, including, and they tried to make topics which will stick to your teeth so that sugar will remain in your mouth for a longer time. And they found that in this period, in the period for which they did this, after 63 children who received this 500 developed deterioration of their teeth successfully. Successfully proving what they were looking for. Then in 1949, they removed sugar, went back to a less sugar diet, and they found that their teeth started improving. And that is where, by then, from where the recommendation has come to children, that children should eat sweets only once every week rather than spread over the whole day. So if you eat lots of them on one day, it's okay. But you shouldn't be doing it every day. Next, please. Now, when this, for this study, the confectionery industry donated that one was needed. Because they wanted, they thought, food that should have a good experience. And they thought if this is proven that you have nothing to do with carry the UK. And that's why they supported this study. And they gave lots of money, hundreds of uh, chocolates and candles to fund them. They are now to design companies that will stick to tea for staying home for the winter time. But when this was found, the industry was not pleased. And they were somehow to delay the publication of results. Study started in 47. 49, they did the intervention. But the results were not made public till 1953. And then that has one of the things that people are criticizing that if they had results, why did they delay publication? But sometimes it is interesting. If you go back to before 1990s, you don't find any mention that it's so early. That why did this happen? Why did they not publish the results? It's only 1990s that people have come back and lost it that is already. It's a bit like we going today and saying James did this experiment, but so the line of where what is ethical, what is unethical, as we said earlier, law is very clear. But law in law, even if you don't return something, that would be the same thing as the norms. But in ethics, things are different. Next, please. So, where does the problem come? When we in medicine decide to do research, I am seeing the patient in one way. He thinks I am a speaking physician. And I have several diseases. But he thinks that I am doing what a physician is. Which is, I should do whatever is I do. You just wake up the person and say, uh, uh, no, 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 speak when you see it. Uh, so, then my comment is not your. So the issue is when you are a physician, doctor, the patient thinks that you will do that something that is best for the patient. On that condition, you are a reason. Your commitment is towards the experiment. Then the experiment you have started to find a valid answer, the answer that you will be will be valid. So you really need to balance these two. If the two are not relevant, there are ways to do this, and that's what you will hear about the next few days. You can change your study composition, you can change your method in such a way, or you can bring it up. Right? The principle, the ethical principle that you will hear about in the next few days, the idea is not to prevent medical research, but to do medical research, because actually, medical research. It may not be an individual interest. It is in the interest of society at large. And ultimately, we are not a person. All of you have COVID vaccines? Anybody? Who 
four or four hundred fifty. That we seem to be a bit unsure. Okay, you can't find out, isn't it? Okay, so. Premium was spoken this year, even today they are going to be given on this, right? And they are going to be given on this, right? And they are going to be given on this, right? They are going to be given on this, right? They are going to be given on this, right? But if we didn't do this, we could not have benefited so many billions of people. So idea is that we do something that we try to minimize this conflict between what is the investment and individual, what is the interaction of the investigator and make the analogy what is the interest of the system so that we do research by interfering to the minimum possible with the principal that the patient has to care for the provide the best care to the person. Next, please. So, there is declaration of Helsinki, it is something. That was so I And then this is the first attempt by physicians, the former attempt after the Second World War. So it's a better of the principles regarding human experimentation, it divides periodically the most recent, I mean technically I was the last year when I made this slide, it was 2013. And then I went from and there have been some addition, not revision, but verification. So instead of 11 paragraphs, now there is 37. Again, these are not legally binding. Just like all the society guidelines that you have in the security, none of them is legally binding. But they are, these ones are supposed to be morally binding. And this was the first significant attempt by medical community regulating themselves for these things. Next, please. And then came Belmont Report. And again, you hear about it more. This was. So created by the National Commission for Protection of Human Subjects uh, of Biomedical and Behavioral Research in the US. These were issued a few years later, that was 72, this was 78, 79. And this came because of the strategy of the day. It was in 72, around two years and then this happened. It's something ethical principles and guidelines for research and modern movements. And you will hear from these three words very often. Respectful person of the family, beneficence. Some people divide the head of beneficence and non beneficence, we hear about that, and it's just this. And basically, there are three main areas how we ensure this by taking informed consent, not consent, but informed consent, assessment of risk and benefits, and how to use the head of it. Subjects who are at least risk from research, right? And now, currently, we have something called as ICMR guidelines. These are also changed over time. The latest one is 2017. There is some minor, uh, I didn't have any published even there, but this is what each of us is required to follow. In principle, the principles remain the same. Some of you have attempted laying out procedures so that we can ensure what we are seeing. For that matter, you know, every way in life we have some. Suggestion on how we do this and still be good citizens, good people, and that's what we are. With that, I'm going to end up with the presentation. Any questions, any comments, please be free. Anyone? No? Anyone want to talk about any example there in life? You found a difficulty. In deciding whether something was right or wrong in medicine, I'm not saying in general. Anybody? Yeah. 